I tell you what, I don't care if you got a shack, if you got a bump pit, or what you got. You can call it home because he's there with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Open your Bibles this morning. Jeremiah chapter 44. I keep thinking eventually God will let me go somewhere else. I don't know how long we've been in here. To my knowledge, I've never tried to preach from these verses before. But that's okay. Let's just pray this morning that I'll do what God would have me to do. Pray that I'll get the touch that I need. Pray that God will move in hearts and lives. Praying this morning. There's something will be said that might show somebody they need Jesus Christ. If you're able to stand this morning and respect the God's Word, I'm only going to read two verses. Jeremiah chapter 44, that's verses 27 and 28. The Bible says, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah and all the remnant of Judah that are gone in the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know, listen to this, whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's look to the Lord. Father, as we come to you one more time, we thank you for the day that you give us and for the way you took care of us and watched over us. We thank you for every need being supplied. You have been better to me than I have reserved. You've been better to me than I have expected. Father, I realize this morning it's all for you. God, I want to thank you for the privilege of being back in your house this morning. I thank you for each one of these that's come out. And I thank you, Lord, we've got this time that we can worship together, fellowship together, meet together. One more time this side of eternity. But God, this morning I thank you more than anything for salvation. Greatest gift anybody could ever receive is coming to know Jesus Christ in a personal way. I thank you, Lord, for the cross that he died on. I thank you for the blood that he shed. I'm thankful, Father, it was sufficient. I ask you, God, please forgive me for I failed you, for I've come short. Anything between me and you get it out of the blood. Father, this morning, I thank you for the service already. I truly thank you for the time in Sunday school. I thank you for the time in the prayer room. I thank you, Lord, for the songs that were sung. Father, I even thank you for the offer to be able to return a portion back to you. God, this morning, now it's time to preach. God, I need your help this morning like never before. I need you to reach down this morning and give me that fresh touch and that fresh anointing from on high. I beg you, God, to give me the words you'd have said and show me what you'd have me to do. I realize this morning that I can do nothing in my own. But Father, I've got to have the preacher to come down. But Father, you used me this morning in a way that you see fit. And I pray, God, that what's said is according to your will. Watch my mouth. Don't let me say it wrong. Don't let me lead anybody astray. Go with us now through the remainder of this service and have your way. And for what you do, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point, the captivity has taken place. Zedekiah has watched his sons die. And then his eyes were put out. He was taken and changed to Babylon. Mm -hmm. There was a remnant left. And the captain of the guard put somebody in charge and said, you take care of the rest of this. But you had some that said, we're not staying. They go to Jeremiah and they say, Jeremiah, you see what God wants us to do and whatever He wants us to do, that's what we'll do. We'll be obedient now. Jeremiah 
Jeremiah comes back, I think it, ten days later when he comes back, he says, God said, do not go to Egypt, but stay right here in the land. Folks, they had forgot about all those years ago when they came out of Egypt. And they wanted to go back to it. Mm -hmm. And they looked at Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, you speak falsely. So they took off down to Egypt, took Jeremiah with sort of forced him to go. And God says, okay, you've not learned a thing by these people going into captivity. Mm -hmm. You're still being disobedient. You're still being disrespectful. You're still saying that my word is wrong and you're going to do it your way. In this chapter, they begin to even talk, or he begins to talk to them where they are baking cakes and pouring out drink offerings and lighting incense to the Queen of Heaven. You say, who's the Queen of Heaven? You've got to go back to Babylonian pagan religion. Known by several different names. Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Severanus, the wife of Baal. Severanus, in her physical form, was married to a man by the name of Nimrod. You can read about him in the book of Genesis, who made his home in the plains of Shinar. And the plains of Shinar, if you look, and I can't remember the chapter in the book of Zechariah, tells us that the plains of Shinar is where the very seed of evil dwells. You say, where's the plains of Shinar? It's between the Tigris and the Euphrates River in present day Iraq. Where the evil is still coming from. Y'all say whatever you want to say. Once Babylon, always Babylon. Yeah. So they're still worshiping the Queen of Heaven. They're still worshiping idols. And they use the excuse with Jeremiah, you know, as long as we were pouring out the drink offerings, as long as we were baking cakes in honor to her, as long as we were worshiping her and burning incense, we had plenty to eat. Things went just fine. You say, well, preacher, how do you explain that? I'll tell you very plainly how to explain it. Come on, wait, God has long suffered us for not willing that any should perish. And God will let you stay in your sin just to try to give you another chance and another chance and another chance to come to know Him. Yeah. Amen. Good, brother. But after a while, yeah. God says, now the rubber's getting ready to meet the road. Yeah. You've got an option. You've got a choice. You've got a decision. You've got to make. Now, the last several weeks, I have tried to preach on the realness of hell and the realness of heaven, yeah. the difference in righteousness and unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And this is not a series. I didn't plan any of this ahead of time. Godliness, ungodliness. We either accept Christ or we reject Christ. We believe God's Word or we don't believe God's Word. Right. Right. And now He tells them. I mean, you look through the rest of the book of Jeremiah. He's, he's bringing and talking about woes and curses on other land. Right now, these people who are in Egypt are about to hear something you better listen close to me this morning. Behold, I watch over them for evil and not for good. You remember? Was it chapter 11? Where it said, My thoughts of you are not evil, but only good continually to bring you to an expected end. Right. But he says, Now things have changed. You learn nothing by the captivity. You say, preacher, this got nothing to do with it. Oh, yeah, it does, because the book of Hebrews tells us that all these things were written for our admonition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the things in the Old Testament were written for our warning. He's still the same God this morning. Amen. And what He called sin then, it still calls now. 
He's still a God of love and mercy, and I'm so thankful for that. Yeah. God of grace. But He's a God of judgment. He's a God of righteousness. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. When the hammer drops, none of us can imagine what it's going to be like. Amen. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that escape the sword shall return to the land of Egypt and the land of Judah and all the remnant of Judah that are going into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand. Mine or theirs. Amen. There's going to come a time that people are going to stand before Christ and read Matthew chapter 7 and say, Lord, we've done all of this. That was enough. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depart from me. Mm -hmm. There are people that are going to stay and say, but I was a member of the church. But Acts chapter 8 tells us about a man by the name of Simon who was not only a member of the church, but the preacher's running buddy that was still lost and on the way to hell. Yeah. Whose word's going to say? When a man looks at the preacher and says, my good is going to outweigh my bad. Whose word is going to stand when I say, no, but there's none good, no, not one. Right. You say, preacher, you went over this the last few weeks. Yep, sure have. <clears throat> and I didn't know this is where it was coming to. But preacher, I've never done anything bad enough to go to hell, but you've never done anything good enough to stay out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Whose word is going to stink? Theirs or mine? Well, I'm just going to give you the short version right here in one sentence. I don't care what happens in this world. God's word is going to stand and there ain't one blessed thing me, you, or anybody else can do about it. Amen. So let me just give you this real quick and we'll quit. First time I ever stood and tried to preach and made a mess of it, told everything I knew in about three and a half minutes and was done. Psalm 119, verse 89. The Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Can I give you a little bit of something right now? What we need to do is not worry about God's word being settled in heaven. We need to get it settled here on earth. Amen. We need to get it settled in some hearts and lives. Mm -hmm. We need to say, God, I've been wrong all this time. God, your word says it. And it's time for me to believe it. God, your word says it. And I don't care what Dr. So-and-so says or Reverend So-and-so says. I don't care what brother so-and-so says. If he contradicts your word, God, I need to get away from them and be concerned with what thus saith the Lord. Forever, O oh Lord. Time does not mean anything to the Word of God. It'll stand. Listen to me. I'm 62 years old. In a million years, what that book says today is still going to be the truth. Right. It's going to be just as much truth right now. And people will say, that ain't relevant for today. You're out of your mind. It's just as relevant for today as it's ever been. God is still on suffering. Not willing that any should perish. God would have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And yet we sat around and we walk away from Him. Amen. We refuse to obey Him. And when we do that, we're telling God, He's wrong. Mm -hmm. And God said, well, whose word's going to stay? Yours or mine? Get settled in heaven. There's no doubt about it. Amen. Every one of us sitting in here this morning needs to ask the question, is it settled in my heart? Amen. Do I believe this morning that without Jesus I have no hope? Do I believe this morning that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do I believe this morning that He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? 
Oh, God, I'm going to tell you. That's why the Bible says there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that comes home because heaven already knows what's true. Amen. And it's time for a lost and dying and hell-bound world to learn what's true and what's not. Amen. He said, well, preacher, one of these days this word is just going to know, sir. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. Right. Amen. Whose words going to stand? Yours or mine? Can I tell you something right there? In a hundred years, a conversation you had yesterday ain't nobody going to remember. Mm -hmm. right. Probably in a month, a conversation that I've had with people ain't going to be remembered. But one of these days, when the elements melt with a fervent heat and the heavens are rolled back like a scroll, God's Word is still going to stay. Mm -hmm. Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 at the very end, He says, And I saw a great white throne, and he that sat upon it from whose face, face the heaven and earth fled away, there was found no place for him. Mm -hmm. But thank God in chapter 21, John says, I saw a new heaven. And a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth passed away and there was no more sea. But nowhere does he say God's word became null and void. Mm -hmm. Nowhere does he say that God's word had expired. Nowhere did he say that God's word had been burned away with a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. Oh, King Jehoiakim. One day God told Jeremiah, he said, you sat down and you get, I don't remember the guy's name that he talked to, he said, but you tell him all my words and you get him to write it down in the book. And the Bible says he read it. He took it to the house of God. They said, wait a minute, we've got to let the king hear this. They take it to King Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim sitting in the winter palace. There's a fire burning in the heart. Old king began to hear the word just like our people in authority are today. He begins to hear the word. He takes a pen knife out. He begins to cut the pages apart and throws them in the fire. Can I tell you something? Fire can't destroy it. It might burn the pages, but it will never destroy the truth of God's word. He goes back and he tells Jeremiah what happened. God said, hey, that don't change a thing. You tell him to get him some more paper and another pen. And you tell it right back to him again. Mm -hmm. Told it right back to him again. Listen to me, folks. Throw my Bible in the fire if you want to. Sling it out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. But it will not change the fact of the truth of God's Word. Amen. And when it's all over and done with, whose Word's going to stand? Right. Yours or His? Heaven and earth's going to pass away. It's going to be destroyed. God's going to make all things new one of these days. But that word will not change. That's right. It's going to stand when nothing else will. That's right. Amen. The Bible tells us. First Peter. In First Peter in chapter 1, he begins to quote some passages out of Isaiah chapter 40. He says, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. Now, ladies, y'all need to think about something. Let's look at flowers for a minute. You cut them, and they real pretty. I've seen a lot of six hundred dollar casket <coughs> sprays come through that funeral home, and in the middle of July or the middle of January, and you know what they look like in about three days? Mm -hmm. Fall in the dump because they dead. They wilted. And what was absolutely beautiful is as ugly as it can be. Too much heat, too much cold, don't add no water, they ain't going to last. The grass withered. The flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord mm -hmm. endureth forever. He said, what does that mean? He says, for all flesh is his grass. And the glory of man is a flower of grass. This is fall of the year. Y'all know what the leaves are doing? 
They're changing colors. They're falling off. It ain't going to be long after they hit the ground. They're going to dry up. They're going to crumble. Mm -hmm. You say, what's that got to do with man? Look at the top of my head. You can tell I'm in the fall of life. It used to be brown. Sure did. It was a long time ago. But just as the grass of the field, wildflowers, the leaves on the trees, they begin to wither, they begin to change, you begin to know that you're going from one season to another. And after fall comes winter. And everything outside dies. You and I, one of these days, are going to be that same way. If the Lord don't come back first, you're going to die. Some of us is already showing the signs of being on the downhill side. Miss Will tell me once in a while, she'll say, you, you talk about dying so much. I, there's reality. Am I looking forward to dying? The only thing I'm looking forward to is meeting Jesus. Amen. Right. You know, I got grandchildren. I want to see them grow up. Yeah. But reality is, all flesh is as grass. Mm -hmm. And the hair begins to change. Wrinkles begin to show up. Your steps ain't quite as fast as they used to be. Mm -hmm. The strength begins to go away when you read the last, the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. It starts out with remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. And it begins to talk about different parts of the body. It begins to talk about the grinders. Your teeth ain't as good as they used to be. It begins to talk about the light because your eyes aren't as good as they used to be. It begins to talk about the windows of your body which are the ears and the, the sounds don't come in Quite as good. And here's what I've never understood, but this is what Scripture said, and it's true. You get to the point you can't hear as good, but at the night when you're sleeping, just the smallest little thing can wake you up. So remember it when you're young, because you're going to get old. And one of these days you're going to die. So how does he close out that chapter? He said, let's hear the confession. The, the, the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. Amen. Whose word's going to stand? Yours or mine? That's what He's asking. Whose word's going to stand? Man's or God's? Mankind is going to die. Mm -hmm. God's still alive and well and doing just fine. The only time a part of God died is when Christ went into the tomb for three days and three nights. But thank God I serve a God that lived and was dead, but behold, He's alive forevermore. Amen. And He is... People, we need to look at this. Make sense. You said it in Sunday school this morning. He is that living Word. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things are made by Him and without Him there was nothing made that was made. But you get down to verse 14 it takes away all doubt when it says and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if, if all of a sudden God blessed me and I became like Methuselah and lived almost a thousand years it still ain't going to change a thing. God's Word is still going to stand. Right. The Word of the Lord endureth forever. There is nothing that can destroy it. Oh, we can take the Ten Commandments off the courthouse walls. We can take these different perversions of Scripture and change them any old way we want to change them. But it ain't going to change. We can rip the pages out. We can wind them up, throw them in a the trash can, throw them in a the fire. It's not going to change. It's still going to endure forever. 
And that's why Paul said it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, though our outward man <coughs> perish, uh, thank God the inward man is renewed day by day. Amen. You say, how's that inward man renewed? Thank God I'm feeding him. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeding him on something that's going to last. Yeah. That Word of God right there, it doesn't matter what you go through. You put your trust in it, you realize it's real, you realize it's going to stay. Thank God He'll get you through everything else you're going through in this world. Mm -hmm. If you let it. Yep. Whose Word's going to stay? Ours or God? He tells us in Proverbs chapter 30, every, every word of God is pure. Pure! And then he says the same thing that Moses said. He said the same thing that Jesus said. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Don't take anything away. What do you, what do you mean now? Don't, don't, don't add anything to it. How much poison would it take to make that whole bottle of poison? One drop. You say, oh, that ain't much, and then you drink it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You with me? You change one word in that book and that book is a liar. Mm -hmm. You take away one word. When Solomon in Proverbs chapter 30 said it was pure, he said there's no dirt, there's no pollutants, there's no contaminants. It is God-breathed, God-inspired, and those holy men of old, they didn't write their own words, but they moved, they wrote as they were moved as the Holy Ghost gave them the knowledge and the power. Mm -hmm. When I begin to change God's word, I pollute it. Yeah. And once it's polluted and once it's impure, then it's no longer going to stay. You know, I don't know how long it's been. Several years ago, I brought in a parallel Bible that had about eight different translations in it mm -hmm. and made the statement that service that that would be the only time that they ever heard NIV, RSV, and some of them other LMNOPs, whatever they are, come out of this pulpit. Because I wanted to show the difference. Yeah. My Bible says, and that, this is the only example I'm going to give you. My Bible says, a virgin shall conceive Amen. and bring forth a son. God said, Joseph, fear not to take Mary to be your wife. For that's it conceived in her as of the Holy Ghost. And yet you read those other translations and she's not a virgin, she's a young lady. Right. Mm -hmm. Young ladies ought to be virgins. Right. But they're not necessarily so. They begin to call Joseph his father. No, sir. The closest I'll come to even accepting that if you want to call him his stepfather. <laughs> But Joseph was not his father. We take those translations. Well, we want to make it easier for people. Let me tell you how to make Scripture easier for you. Mm -hmm. Get saved. Amen. Because the Bible tells us a natural man cannot understand mm -hmm. spiritual things. And if you get saved by the grace of God, the Bible says that when you lack wisdom, ask of God and He'll give it to you liberally and upbraideth not. Right. Amen. Well, I can't understand it. Well, get right with God and then beg Him to open your eyes. Amen. Do I understand it all? No. Do I understand more than I have in the past? Absolutely.
God's word's pure. God's word's true. God's word's going to stand. You say whatever you want to say. Moses told him right before he died there in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, don't you add, don't you take away or diminish all from it. Revelation chapter 22 says, if you add to this word, I'll add unto you the plagues that are written therein. Mm -hmm. If you take away from this, these words, I'll take your name out of the book of life. You say, wait a minute, preacher. No, here, let me give you a Stokes County translation. That means if you're saved by the grace of God, you ain't going to muck you around with God's word. Amen. Amen. We don't need any translations. We just need to read it. Amen. I'm about done. So whose word's going to stand? Ours or God's? Man's or God's? Yours or God's if you're not saved? You can hear me this morning. You could have heard me for the last seven, eight, ten weeks, whatever it was, and you can say, well, preacher, I'm going to take my chances. In hell, you'll lift up your eyes. Be in torment. Preacher, I'm going to take my chances. Then you're calling God a lie. The Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 23, God is not a man. That he should lie, neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. The Bible says, Hath he said, and I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God says what he means, means what he says, and what he says is going to happen. Now you believe him or you believe yourself. There is a lost and dying world out here that if they had any inkling of what their future held, they'd be kicking the doors down trying to get in here. And yet how many people listen, whether they're in here, watching on Facebook, going back and watching on YouTube, or listening on telephone, how many people they hear it and pay absolutely no attention. That's like the man a few several years ago coming here for a while, then quit coming. Got mad at something I'd preached straight out of the book. Told me he wasn't coming back. And told me there were some people here in this church and told him, said, well. Just, just take what you like. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope he'll say it because he ain't. That if he ain't, there's some people in this church, his blood going to be dripping off your hands. What has God said that did not come to pass? The only thing I can think of right now, the Lord ain't come back yet. Right. Yeah. Prophesied 4,000 years beforehand. He said there's one coming. That old serpent, you might bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, thank God, in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that was under the curse of the law. Right. God is not a man that he should lie. That's why Romans chapter 3 says, let God be true in every man alive. Mm -hmm. Back to the verb again. Genesis chapter 1. God spoke and it was good. So he's telling us today. He says, And those into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand. Mine or they? Whose word is going to stand in your life? Yours or God? God's not a man that he should lie. God doesn't need to repent. God says it and it comes to pass. Let there be light. There was light and it was good. 
God separated the light from the darkness. The light he called day, the darkness called night, and it was good. He created all the waters. He created all the land. He created all the animals. God's never done anything that wasn't good. What about you and me? You said, Preacher, can you, do you truly believe that a man 2,000 years ago went to a cross outside Jerusalem, was nailed to that cross, shed his blood? Do you truly believe that blood has cleansed you of your sins? Yes. Well, let me just put it to you like this. I'm banking my eternal salvation on it. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you something. There was a time in my life, I ain't saying this proudly, and just just let's just hear me. I would make a wager on what color the next car was going to be coming down the road. Well, let me tell you this. I have put it all. I ain't trying to belittle this. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't tell me y'all ain't never played poker. You ain't never played back, blackjack. No, I don't hear it. But I put it in terms you can understand. There was a day that I went all in. Amen. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I firmly believe today, without a doubt, that Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind. That He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That He is coming back after His church. And if you've not been saved by the grace of God, you will be left behind. That He will, seven, day, seven years later, He'll come back on that white horse those feet will hit the Mount of Olives and it's going to cleave in two and he's going to ride through that kid, across that Kidron Valley in that eastern gate and he's going to sit on the throne of David and for a thousand years there's going to be heaven on earth. Yeah. I truly believe that at the end of that thousand years the white throne judgment's going to take place and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life are going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second day. You say, preacher, where does that leave you? Thank God that leaves me in a robe of white. Mm -hmm. To live in perfect peace throughout eternity. You say, so you're better than I am. No, no. I'm just forgetting. Right, right. Because I truly believe that His blood does cleanse from all sin. Whose word's right? Whose word's going to say? Well, God made it very plainly when Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, Ye must be born again. Mm -hmm. Not born in the flesh, but born of the Spirit. The day that you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, that you're on your way to hell, and the only hope that you have is the Lord Jesus Christ, and you fall down before Him, begging for mercy, acknowledging what you are, acknowledging who He is, acknowledging He is the only way to get right with the Father. There is one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. Amen. It ain't this preacher. It ain't a bishop somewhere. It ain't the Pope. It's not Mary. It's not one of the apostles. But it's Christ and Christ alone. Amen. You say, how can you say that? Because that's what God's Word says. Right. right. And whose Word is going to stand? Man's or God? So this morning, if you ain't never paid attention to me before, you better listen now. Look in the depths of your soul and know this morning where you're headed. 
said, Preacher, there's things in my life, the blood of Jesus Christ, God, some cleanse from all sin. But, but preacher, I'm getting to be get some age on me, and I've never been much. I've never been much for church. I I don't know how old the apostle Paul was, but when Jesus met him on the it, Damascus road, mm -hmm. Paul's words to him was, "Lord, what would you have me to do?" Yeah. And I can tell you what the Lord would have you to do this morning. I don't care how old you are. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt. Be saved. Mm -hmm. Those are his words. Whose words are you going to believe? Yours or his? Whose words are you going to stand? Yours or his? His has been settled since before the foundation of the world was laid. And they'll still stand throughout all eternity. Your words and my words are never to be remembered again. Thank God the Word of God still says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It ain't time to play games now. We're coming down to it. Folks, I look around and I see the world today and I say, thank God. Thank God. Yeah. I know Him. He knows me. The Lord. Because the way the, the, the shape and the way that the world's getting in right now, what hope is there for mankind outside mm -hmm. of Christ? Amen. So today, you want to stay in Egypt? Stay in Egypt. I tried to preach Wednesday night on do you want liberty or do you want death? You want to stay in Egypt and perish? Perish. There's nobody can make that choice for you but yourself. God wants you to live. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to come under Him. Whose word's going to stay? God's or man's? Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for allowing us to be back in your house. We thank you for each one of these that's come out. We thank you, Lord, at this time to come together and the opportunity to look at a portion of your word that I realized this morning. It's a simple message. Now I beg you today, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus as Savior, God, I pray today that this would be the day of salvation. I pray, God, that you can be in touch. And I realize, God, this morning, you've told us we can't come unless you draw. And God, I pray this morning that there's nobody here that you've turned over to a reprobate mind. I pray, God, this morning that even if there's somebody on the side of my voice that you've dealt with many times, I pray, God, you'll deal with them one more. Give them one more opportunity to come to know Jesus. Father, there's no amount of explanations. There's no amount of rationalization. There is nothing, no discussion that we can make. There's no argument we can make. That's going to override your word. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. God, I'm thankful this morning. Your word is going to stand. Do you have your way in this invitation? Father, for what you do, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory for we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.